Hey folks, Dr. Mike and Dr. James here again. Again. Gonna keep it loose and casual for this one and hopefully stir the brain a little bit. Stir the pot? Yeah, why not? So, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, obviously we can't do a whole lecture on motivation that would require an entire course, which we'll probably have for you later. But um, just a couple of facets of motivation for training and today, Dr. Uh, Hoffman and I, what did Dr. James, Dr. Hoffman, James? You know, whatever. Whatever. My friends call me Ho Man. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. We're not friends. So. Uh, um, we're going to be talking about and sharing some of our own thoughts and then hopefully looking to you guys to give this some thought yourself and maybe interact with us in our webinar about uh, this topic. Talking about what motivates us to continue to strive to diet and to train and what motivates you and particularly what are law the big question behind this talk is there are many ways to motivate oneself what are the ways that are sustainable and at the same time kind of life affirming because if somebody like kills your family in front of you when you're a little kid, and that could give you a, a very sustainable source of motivation to take ultimate revenge on them. Batman. Right. But that, that's not exactly life affirming. And one of the things that runs through the Batman graphic novels and the cartoons and the books is that it's just killing him inside. Not in the sense that it's literally killing him, but it's just a really, he's having a bad time to put it another way. So, we're going to be looking for that kind of motivation that is three things. Effective, sustainable over the long run, and something you can look back on and say, you know, this whole thing was great. As opposed to, you know, the Batman stuff, which has two of the three of those. and uh, Some other forms are very great, but not sustainable, and, and everywhere in between. So, you know, the first, uh, I guess the first question is... Sustainability. Yeah, so sustainability is something you want to think about in terms of, you know, where are you drawing your motivation from and how is it driving you? And are you trying to do it from like a place of nastiness where you're saying like, ugh, I'm jealous or I'm envious or, you know, like, ugh, I just wish I had it. And I don't have it. Ugh, that's going to drive you nuts, right? It's not a good way of going about it. You know, like for me, I think I personally draw my sustainability because when I was growing up, my favorite things were like, you know, like the Rocky movies. Dragon Ball Z, like all this stuff where you get to watch people train and it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that they were fighting, right, that really got you pumped up for it. It was like all the stuff that they did so that they could fight, right? It was all the training that they went through. And I think that's something that's like, in terms of sustainability, something that's really going to drive the process a lot harder than focusing on like endpoints, goals as just the end all be all, right? Like you have to enjoy part of the process being there and you have to do it because you really just want to do it, not because there's some weird thing that's driving you nuts or that you are envious or jealous of or somebody has that you don't have, spitefulness. There's a lot to say on that. One thing I'd like to touch on and I'd like to hear your thoughts on as well, James, is the often, not always, but often overvaluing of end goals as a source of motivation for most people. I'll tell you this, I don't know what... Uh, what your experience was like in this regard at East Tennessee, though. I think we talked about it and it was kind of similar. Uh, James and I got our PhDs together. He got his uh, one year after I did. I worked into the ground for my PhD and I was expecting ascension afterwards. <laughs> I was expecting... Where's the parade? Yeah. I was expecting, you know, like a blow up Snoopy doll, and Mickey Mouse, and confetti, and for sure, uh, ticker tape parade. I was expecting that once people called me doctor, that it was going to feel incredible. That I forget about that. That that the accomplishment of the PhD was in itself going to feel that I was like a new person, and that feeling, that ascension was going to be all worth it. Unfortunately, in the month or two after getting my PhD, I never felt much of that. I felt a little bit of it, and with time, I grew into loving my status and my accomplishment of what I did. 
But right afterwards, I didn't feel a damn bit different. And it left me with this huge gaping hole of what the hell am I doing? What, how did I rip, how did I get so ripped off? Yeah. It's like a weird form of like, it's like somewhere between postpartum depression and Stockholm syndrome. hundred percent. hundred percent. That's the perfect way to say it, say it. I basically, you know, it, it was one of those, uh, I used a really nasty uh, analogy at the time. I won't repeat it here, but it's all, it was almost like the difference between uh, finishing my PhD felt like finishing a battle in which a ton of your good friends and fellow soldiers die. Everyone at home is cheering that the war it's is over. Pretty, pretty true. Your friends and relatives are <laughs> congratulatory. Everyone thinks it's great, but you gave so much to the process, you lost a part of yourself. And you know, the, the people who are cheering that the war is over are usually not the ones who fought the war. The ones who fought the war have a, a, a calmness about them, a relief, but a bit of a resignation that not all was won and some things were lost. That's how I felt about finishing my PhD. So I had given so much to it and this ascension never came and it only came later. In, in retrospect, what do I look fondly on about getting my PhD is the process itself, is the grinding of the work. It made me a different person. It gave birth to RP because only when I ascended to that level of productivity, of knowledge, of ability to balance athleticism and academics, that I started becoming productive enough to be Dr. Mike Isertel. That's where I became Dr. Mike Isertel, but the becoming wasn't something I could even detect occurred. So a lot of times we get so caught up in when I win this competition, boy, oh boy, is everything gonna be different. And oftentimes it's not. Um, People think about, you know, how do Olympic champions feel? How do how does Mr. Olympia feel? How does Phil, he uh, Phil Heath feel? Hungry. Uh, he probably feels like Phil Heath. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there's this interesting balancing act you also have to do with, you know, like I nowadays I'm like Dr. Mike Isertel, I'm this quote unquote big deal or whatever, like all these followers and I've produced a lot of value. Do I feel good about that? Not really. Why? Because like I'm just not a cocky person like that. Like every time I play with the role of feeling proud of what I've accomplished, I'm like I'm no better than anybody else. Why the hell would I feel like a like a big dog in these bullshit accomplishments? And they're nice accomplishments, but would I really take a lot of pride from and motivation? Seems to be much more the process yeah. of doing these things versus the person I've become. So it, it, it's it's uh, I'll put it to you this way. I mean, James, you can weigh in. If you're hoping, if you hate the process and it's not motivating you at all, and you're hoping that once you accomplish your new level of body fat, you win the next competition, you qualify for regionals, if you think that is going to elate you to some new just bar in which you're going to be floating with the angels in the heavens and everything is going to be great, you might be right, but it's a very good chance you just feel like you the next morning. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's kind of like a varying degrees of like intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation and everything in between. But I think for a lot of us, we we pick we do it kind of in an ass backwards way where we actually pick our goals, not necessarily just because we want the goals, but it gives us an excuse to train for something, right? We really just want to train. We want to have something to work towards and accomplish, right? The goal is more of a formality where it's like, yeah, sure. I would love to squat 475 sometime in the next couple of years, but really I just want to get into the train, to get into the gym and, mm -hmm. and work for it, right? Try to get stronger, try and have those really good lifts where you feel really good about yourself and you come home and you're like, man, I'm beat up for days. I'm getting this much closer, right? Whether or not like I actually get it, it's really inconsequential. It's more about like the struggle. So, so you tend to be motivated personally by the love of the training process. Yeah. And I think, you know, like it's different. Like some people might, you know, I think that's a little bit more of an intrinsic approach, but I think some people might have a completely extrinsic approach, which is not right or wrong. It's just different. It's um, just unlikely for most people. I think so. But I think, you know, like some people just want to have that Instagram post. Like they do this whole thing and they really, they don't give a shit if they're going to be the next physique uh, or, you know, figure person, but they really just want to get like that high five, that social support, that picture on Instagram with like you're a six pack and you look great and everyone's like, you're the man. And that's good enough. You know what I mean? That's why they're but doing does it. Does that keep them rolling months and years later? I would say no. 
I would so say it's not sustainable then. Yes. Yeah. Effective, but not sustainable. Because remember, we're not even talking about, we're talking about two things, sustainability and good place versus bad place. Um, we're, I missed one when I started talking about this because uh, effect is, it has to be effective, sustainable, and come from a good place and be rewarding. Uh, we're not talking about effective, it's obvious. It has to be effective, right? We're not even right. going to mention that. Of course, <laughs> motivation has to be effective. So if it's not motivating you, who cares, right? <laughs> so if the training process isn't motivating to you, who cares? Don't do it. I, James and I would probably both say, try to cultivate a love for training. Because if you love the process of training, nothing else matters. People ask, you know, I've asked me, mostly people not associated with the fitness industry, friends, relatives who don't lift, why I suffer so much bodybuilding and doing jujitsu. I mean, you do kickboxing. James will come home with a like huge welt on his leg, like limping. I'm like, what happened? He's like, we're well, kick training today. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> The thing is, is that people don't understand that why do you do this to yourself? Because I love the process. Uh, it's like asking someone who's drinking, like, what's your goal with this? Like, it feels good to drink? I'm not sure. Like, what do you want out of this party? Can you imagine that question? Like, why are we going to this party? Like, to have To get wasted, fun? have fun, yeah. Like, wait, but what's the end goal at this party? You're like, well, to get home. The party, right? <laughs> For sure. And then someone could say, like, why not just get home now? Or like, right, okay, I said that wrong. The end goal is the party. When training is a party, motivation is not an issue. And then if you want a goal, you just pick a goal and then it all works well together. So I think our best advice on the sustainability is to fall in love with the process of training. And sometimes that occurs organically and sometimes you have to make a conscious, maybe not effort, but a re-realization every now and again that, hey, am I enjoying this? Let's try to enjoy this because there's a lot of things about training you can love or you can not paying not pay attention to them and just put that grit and put the metal in and everything's hateful and all of a sudden you're like, it's all about the goal. Well, if you learn to love training, the goals come and the goals go and you still accomplish just as much. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said too. It's not like all sunshine and rainbows either. Like it, we, when we say we you know we really like training, we love training, it's not that For the like, most part. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's like there's nothing really all that enjoyable about putting hundreds of pounds on your back and moving up and down or getting kicked in the leg or like choking, getting choked out not, at practice. Not eating as much as or not, not. Or starving, right? There's nothing really fun about that. But the real question is, is like at the end of the day, do you get a sense of like satisfaction in what you're doing? It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be like even a happy person necessarily. It doesn't even mean that this is going to give you joy, but it, it gives you some satisfaction, some sense of accomplishment. Like, yes, I've worked towards something. I enjoy this process. That's where the love of the training comes in. It's not necessarily like, man, I love to do four by 10 deficit deadlifts. Nobody loves that. That sucks. You're going to vomit. You're going to be out of commission for like three days. It's just awful. For sure. You know, so I think it's one of those things where I think sometimes people take the like, um, like the unicorn rainbow turd approach where it's like everything's supposed to be happy. I'm supposed to love it. It's supposed to be great. I'm supposed to have ice cream and friends and hold hands and shoot love at each other. Right? No, it sucks. Some of it sucks. Right? But are you, do you feel satisfied at the end of the day, like with what you've done? With the overall process. Yeah. yeah. The process, think, not just outcome. Yeah. 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 I think that's really where it, I guess that even comes into more of an issue of like happiness, but like uh, I think that's where like the satisfaction comes in. Well, let's let's use that to segue into the second point of kind of life affirming positive motivation versus kind of degradatory motivation that's deleterious that leeches away at you. One thing I can think of really quick is this one's for the haters. You know, posts like that, like we're getting a lot of hate lately. What do you guys think of this? Like. What vindication what do you think about that james like, i think it's just it's spiteful it's just nasty right it's like you it's one of like at the end of the day one of the things and like mike and i both have read uh, the books on like the uh game stuff pickup mm -hmm. artist stuff just mm -hmm. for fun because we mm -hmm. think it's funny mm -hmm. but like one of the things that is really important in that aspect is confidence right of course like having social dynamics yeah. social dynamics and having that aura of confidence about you right and so like if you are having to tell people that you're the man you're not the man, right? That's the same thing. You probably like, don't feel like the man. You probably don't feel like the man either. So if you're having to like prove to people that, you know, and like in a spiteful way, like, hey, check it out, like you're wrong or I was right or this and that, it's like, do you, you probably really don't feel very good about it in the first place, right? I found that a lot of the people that are your haters, when you prove them wrong, you realize that they hated on you and about a thousand other people and they were actually 13 year olds in their mom's basement and they're, they don't even remember who you were. Um, one thing I found is people who, you know, said some unfortunate things about me or my academic accomplishments or my physique or something like that, um, 
for some time I was very upset about it. And then when I made my physique better and fixed those things, those same people would be super friendly and be very supportive. And very occasionally I would bring up to them like, oh, not singing the same tune. And they'd be like, what? And I'd be like, you used to talk shit. And they're like, I don't even remember that. And you like bring them back and they're like, oh, dude, sorry, man. I must have been in a real bad place. And they're different people. Like they moved on, but you haven't. Or they were talking smack to 10 people, but you were the only one that let them really get under your skin. Like yeah. at the end of the day, like, man, it's not like they're Lex Luthor and you're Superman. They're just some punk kid in the street and you're Superman. And you may never get their approval. They may not even remember that they hated you. It's all the stuff. It's like, you're really going to let that one person take that much precedence? And, and the thing is, it's cool if you do let them take that much precedence, but how do you feel during that entire time of proving the haters wrong? You feel hateful. You feel bad. You feel bad. That's the only relevant thing to say. Why feel like that? You know, the uh, our old instructor, Dr. Bill Sands, had a great story. I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but basically <laughs> hit on that exact issue. Basically, long story short, Ancient uh, sensei and his young apprentice are walking around, right? And they're just chilling. Sensei's the man. Apprentice really appreciates sensei, right? And they come across like a muddy riverbank that they have to cross at some point. And a woman appears and the woman's like, oh, can you guys help me get across? I don't want to get all dirty. And the apprentice guy's like, how dare you? The sensei is the man. How dare you like even address him? You're nobody. And the sensei's like, yeah, whatever. Helps her across. And in the process, she stays nice and clean. He gets all muddy, right? And so Sensei's all muddy from helping her cross the riverbank. So he dumps her off and it's like, all right, later. And the apprentice is furious and he's like, I can't believe you lowered yourself to helping this person and now you're all muddy. And like, she doesn't, des she didn't deserve that. And he goes, homie, I left her at the riverbank. You're still carrying her. Mm, yeah. yeah. So it's like, are you really gonna, so that guy who trolled you, that 13 year old, that you know, called you names on Xbox Live or whatever. He grew up, he forgot about it all. He didn't carry it with him, right? Mm -hmm. You carried that with you the whole time. And are you gonna really let that cause you anxiety and like burden your life? And like, is that really what's gonna drive you to do great things in life? Like, yeah. come on, yeah. gotta do better than that. And at the end, you know, I have uh, quote unquote proved some haters wrong in my day. It's not very satisfying. At the end, you feel like you did them a service. It's almost like they could get you to do anything just by hating on it. You prove them wrong, you come back and you go, see? And they're like, well, do this now, this other thing. That's not, you know, what are they, your trainer, your coach? You're supposed to have your own motivations and reasons for yeah. doing things. So, And the other thing too is like it's sometimes people get real caught up in the goals. Like you don't have to have goals that say like you're going to be a physique competitor or you're going to run a marathon or you're going to be the best kickboxer in the world, right? Like you can have very simple goals just like, hey, I want to be – a little bit better than I was yesterday, right? A lot of times I've seen people struggle with really long-term goals. I've known a couple of people that within several months of beginning weight training will hashtag future physique pro in Instagram. And it's like, do you have you, any you, idea you what goes into that? that? You have no idea what goes into that. You have no idea if you were become that. I know several people who just stopped competing and stopped training altogether before that ever happened. Um, and the, 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 the real realization there is you, how can that possibly, such a long-term thing, motivate your daily grind? Fundamentally, you're going to have bad days. You're going to have bad workouts. You're going to look at yourself in the mirror three years into this 10-year journey. You're not going to look anything like a physique pro. It's going to demotivate the shit out of you, and you're going to get this overwhelming thought that I'm never going to reach it. But with thoughts like that, of course you're never going to reach it. So instead of saying, I want to be a figure pro eventually... Why don't you say, I want to be bigger and leaner than the last time. Yeah. And let me see where this journey takes me. Did I ever plan on being this current jacked and lean level? No. I used to look at Flex Magazine and all the bodybuilders on the covers and in the pages and think these people are magical. <laughs> They're superheroes. Well, when you're 16, 17, it's like... Absolutely. Uh, and I never thought once I could look like them. But what I did was I loved training and I wanted to get just a bit bigger, just a bit stronger, just a bit leaner. Now I look like them to some great extent. And sometimes I even have like, I'll look at a guy's back and be like, ah, my back's bigger than that guy. And how the hell did I get there? Well, I never had the plan to get there. I just kept going. If I, if it was my goal at age 18 to become a professional or something or to become that big and lean, it would be so daunting I would never think I would achieve it. And a lot of people burn out with goals like that. Mm -hmm. um, but why don't you just enjoy the process? All Remember, how do you get there? The act is the same. Whether or not, whether or not you want to summit the mountain 
or you like walking uphill, you're going to walk uphill either way. Yeah. If you get close enough by walking uphill to where the summit is in view, you can then have the goal. Let's go up and summit today. If you don't like walking uphill, and if you say, I want to summit the mountain, and you look off and you can barely even see it, that's hugely demotivating to a lot of people. So maybe, again, enjoy the process, set shorter term goals, feel a happiness both from doing the work and from accomplishing them, and then life may have in store for you other things. For example, some of the best CrossFitters in the world started out as physique competitors. They never amounted to anything in physique, but they became world champions in CrossFit. Yeah. That's amazing. It's yes. even, in some cases, even more popular of a sport. Dana Lynn Bailey, as an example, wanted to be the best figure girl in the world. She was too muscular. She's too jacked. And Good problem they, to have. Because of her, <laughs> largely, they opened up the women's physique division as an entirely different sport. And she was crowned its first champion, which, which was obvious because she was the, she still is the standard bearer for that look. Yeah. And, uh, you know, imagine if, you know, told her like, oh, you know, what, how instrumental was your trying to be the best figure pro to becoming your best figure pro? And she's like, well, I never actually got there. But because she kept training, she never gave up. All these new opportunities opened up for her, and then she was the best at something. So it's one of the situations, and a lot of people like Ed Cohen actually started as a bodybuilder, believe it or not. He had a pretty good physique. Would he ever have been Mr. Olympia? No, but he just figured out, like, he was doing bodybuilding training, and some of the, I think, the lifters at his gym were like, you're using how much weight on this exercise? <laughs> He's like, I don't know, this much. And they're like, well, why don't you give powerlifting a try? Yeah. And uh, I actually, uh, there's a really quick funny story about Ed Cohen. There was a... This was recounted in a Powerlifting USA magazine where it was like a, a meet in the early 80s and Ed was still very, very, very young and un, unheard of. And a couple of coaches were talking, and this is a big national level powerlifting meet back in the good old sort of light equipment slash raw days. And this one guy goes, you know, I've got a junior, this is a single ply. He goes, I got a junior lifter. I was talking to another coach that's going to total 1,700 at this meet and the, at 165. And the, that's a lot. Yeah. And this guy's like, wow. He goes, and the other guy goes, yeah, I got a junior lifter that's going to total 1,900. And the other guy's like, what? That's ridiculous. Young Ed Cohen. Yeah. <laughs> so it's supposed to be a bodybuilder, but he just, what did he do? He kept training and uh, opportunity opened up. So I think, but you ask Ed Cohen what his relationship to training was. Chad Wesley Smith and I actually asked him what he would have done differently uh, had he programmed his own life uh, training from now, knowing now what he does. So I actually think I did things pretty well. I would have deloaded more often. I would have been mm. more important of fatigue management, but he loved training so much he missed out on that. So this is a person that, you know, I don't know, how many people do you know, James, at the very top who don't like the training process? I don't know any. Well, you know, the thing is too, I think the problem they run into is they're just doing something that they don't necessarily like, right? And so like, and this happens all the time. You don't have to love like hypertrophy training. You don't have to love strength training. You don't have to love sport. I mean, like there are certain, one of the problems you run into is people do it because they think they're supposed to mm. and they're supposed to like it, right? Folks, you can find stuff that you actually like, right? Like, so if you actually deviate from the kind of the typical gym lifestyle and if you just don't want to do bodybuilding training four or five days a week, find something else that you like. Maybe you're really good at running. Maybe you're really good at combat sports. Maybe you're really good at like hiking or swimming or something else, right? That's stuff that you can get behind. I can't tell you how many students we have. And this, I think this is kind of a more life encompassing concept where, you know, like sometimes we'll have students in our major who just aren't doing well. They're just getting like C's and D's and bombing classes. And you have to have a sit down moment with them and say like, look, homie, you're not doing well. You're not giving me your best. Your best actually might be somewhere else. So this is a lose-lose for both of us. You're not getting a lot out of exercise science. We're not getting the student that we want out of you. It might be time to and look it's not like else. you're putting in maximum because you're clearly not because you're clearly not passionate about it at all. Exactly. So like, or remotely interested. Exactly, and that might be somewhere else. It doesn't mean that you suck and you're a terrible student. It just means that this is not this is not your jam, right? Your jam might be somewhere else. And the same thing I think applies to many areas of life, including fitness, where it's like you might hate weight training all the time, and that's okay. Find something else that you actually at least value to some degree. You don't have to necessarily like it in the sense like it doesn't bring you joy because, to be sweating and sure. uncomfortable, but you get satisfaction like from process, it. process, like the results. Um, I think one important thing to say on that note is, you know, we all, all of us listening to this video and watching this video, we all live in the modern um, free world. There is no need to be in shape at a high level other than for health, which doesn't require much shape. There is no need to be amazing at CrossFit. There is no need to be the best bodybuilder of all time. Yeah. Uh, that need is illusory. It is all voluntary. It is all for fun. You know, people walk up into a bodybuilding stage or a powerlifting platform 
and they walk into a CrossFit Games, you know, regional, and they think it's warfare, it's battle, it's do or die. You get a real soldier come up to them and be like, what is it that you're doing here? I want you to explain it to me in basic terms. Maybe there's a language barrier. What would you say? Uh, this is a game. It's for entertainment. It's it's fun. There are spectators. Recreation. It's, re it's literally, <laughs> it's a game. So now that you know that, maybe you can pick the game that you like the most and give it your all. Because fundamentally, if someone tells you, you got to make it big in this sport, unless you're a professional in that sport, in which case you probably don't have any motivational issues, you don't have to make it big in a sport. As a matter of fact, if you're a professional, you can be a professional with a bunch of other stuff. Go be an accountant instead. Well, that's the thing. Like, So to be a professional, I mean, that means that, that that sport or activity or whatever it is you're doing is is basically sustaining your life. Income generating. Right, income generating. And most of us, that's not the case, right? Sure. And you can imagine how much training and sport practice they have to do to actually become like what how, how much training do you have to do to become a, a pro MMA fighter to the point where you actually don't have to have side job right like all of it I mean you have to be 20 hours a week you have to be up there you have to be you have to be start becoming top tier right like mm -hmm. pro level fighter I mean most of those guys you see in, in the lower rankings I mean they have full-time regular mm -hmm. jobs and they do fighting mm -hmm. on the side some of the guys you see in like Bellator they start getting better contracts but they still mm -hmm. don't get enough where they can just train all full-time mm -hmm. they still probably work mm -hmm. At least a couple jobs. I mean, so that's the idea. So that, that's if somebody tells you like you got to be a professional, you got to like train to be a world champion. That's you got to like, be the best. It's total nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think just to you know, we'll leave you guys with some kind of summary points of points of thought. There's so much more to say on this, and maybe we'll do that in later videos or seminars. But I think the biggest cross current here, yes, motivation should be effective. So pick something that works for you, but avoid the stuff that causes you. Anxiety, anxiety that causes you angst, that causes you revenge is never a good motive, no matter how many movies it's entertaining to watch movies about revenge. Like the Punisher. John but, Wick. But, or John Wick. But imagine being John Wick. Does he look happy to you? Imagine being John Wick, not for two hours of a movie, but John Wick all the time. The guy's miserable. You don't want to be John Wick. No. Uh, so do something that is effective, but do it uh, that it's a positive impact on your life, that you're happy doing it and do it in such a way that is sustainable and you're not overreaching and making goals that you can't, uh, uh, you know, grasp. And it's something that's part of a lifestyle. If you check all those three boxes, there's many ways to do it. But fundamentally, if you check all three, you're off to a really great start and you'll probably accomplish more or less what you could from a genetic and environmental standpoint. Um, just to leave off on my end and I'll get to hear your thoughts on this, uh, James. People ask me fundamentally what I like most about jujitsu and about bodybuilding. Jujitsu, for lack of a better term, jamming, flowing. When you're in the moment and you're moving and sticking and pulling off moves, even if you're not winning, if you are being athletic, it feels amazing. You're literally in the rush of combat. It didn't get much more fun than that. That's why I do jujitsu. Not to become some living weapon, although that's happening and it's sweet. Fundamentally, it's the act of doing that. And what is it that I like most about bodybuilding? Is it winning? Sure as hell isn't winning in my case, not just yet, not good enough. It, is it the result? The result is cool. It's the, the act of progress. It's the idea that I put down a weight that I could never do for that many reps. It's the idea of having a tank top on in the gym and going like this in the mirror and going, ah, shit, scare yourself. Like, holy crap, I really look like this? Getting better, not being good. People, a lot of times, like message me on Facebook and be like, oh, I only weigh this and that. You know, it's hard for me to get motivated because I don't look that jacked, but I want to be a bodybuilder. That's maximum motivation to me. It's the progress that was motivating. I, I'm jealous of them in some respects because I've already made most of my major gains. They have so much to look forward to, to the beauty. I look back at my involvement in, in weight training and I look back at so much of the growing and the training and the eating and the knowing you're getting better. And that's the fun part for me. What is it that keeps you going fundamentally in your in your in your sporting endeavors and lifting and in, and in combat training? Yeah, well, for lifting, I just I like I just I'm a weirdo. I just like the process Same of here. lifting, right? Yeah. I don't really even need getting much to set talk up about. A good technique, like and everything. doing mass phase and cut phases for me is just an excuse to have structured training for gym time. Otherwise, I would just do it anyway. Easy problem to solve. You right. like the gym, that's it. Like the gym stuff. I really like the kickboxing stuff, A, because it's a new skill set. It's a skill set. Um, the problem that I've always had as uh, an athlete is I'm 
like, I don't want to say strong, but I'm like stronger than most people, but I have really crappy anthropometry. And kickboxing is like one of the few sports where it actually like- Long limbs come in handy. Long huh? limbs come in handy and I can actually be strong and be, uh, and feel, feel good effective. about doing it, feel mm -hmm. effective. Whereas like a lot of other sports, like when I'm in the gym, I'm not the strongest guy. You know, it's like, I've been training for a long time and if, sometimes it feels like I don't really have all that much to show for it. It doesn't bother me at all. But you know, every now and again, you're like, eh, I wish I could bench more, squat more, but in kickboxing, like I hit the bag and it's like, pew, the bag flies all over the place. Yeah, I've seen and, it. Man. It feels good, right? And so that's a totally selfish, like I like to hit other people. I actually kind of like it to some degree when they hit me, just not in the face. Like when we take leg kicks and stuff. It makes the money. My buddy, like we, we were at practice the other night and the guy hit me really hard in the leg and I was like, ah, and he was like, oh, oh. I was like, no, 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 it's fine, <laughs> keep going. That's keep why going. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing, right? And so, I mean, like for me, that's, and it's just something that like, it just felt like I, did, I never did it before, tried it out was like, wow, I actually, this seems to fall in line with like what I like, I kept doing it, got better at it, and that was it, right? It was like, I can go and try and do marathon training, or I try and be the next, you know, Bruce Jenner before, you know, before he changed over. Or after. Um, but I suck at those things, sure. and that's gonna be miserable for yep. me, and it will never get better. Yep. Find what you like, find what you can get better at, practice it, be in love with the training process, everything else is painted in gold. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for tuning in, folks. See you next time.